Heidi does not support either political party or candidate. So make that clear. There is an issue with this mic, however. I don't know if anybody wants to, who knows about the system can go up there. I will project, but if there is anybody that uh, can do things like unplug and plug in. <laughs> I was thinking a lot about winning and losing this week because my son raced in his championship race across country. He's a senior captain, and I missed a program here Thursday that I very much wanted to be at. But unfortunately, uh, the, the hurricane pushed his event onto that Thursday. But I love sports, and not everybody in ethical culture does necessarily. So I apologize to those who are not as familiar with sporting language uh, because I want to explore it. I love sports, and I love politics. But a disclaimer. Politics is not a game. Uh, sports is. Sports is also a business. Politics should not be a business. So I think it's very dangerous to start mixing sports and politics, even if it's through metaphor. But we do it all the time. We call the campaign a horse race. The debates are sometimes called boxing matches where the candidates stand toe to toe and counter punch each other. And certainly we feel exhausted after political campaign like you would after an athletic event. But I'm going to suggest today that there is something such as, wow, okay. <laughs> that better? Yeah. All right, I won't yell now. Uh, there is something, uh, maybe down just a touch, if we can. There is something that I would call ethical winning and losing. And I want to explore this through the idea of sportsmanship here today. So. Are there ethical ways to win and lose? And do adults maintain those good sport habits that we're taught when we're young? Should we? How will defeated partisans and candidates react Wednesday morning? How will that ethical humanists react after the election, regardless of who wins? Well, can history help us? All right, let's see, we have a liberal incumbent portraying himself as a representative of a common man, burdened by conflicts around the globe, running against a business conservative accused of flip-flopping. You must mean the election of 1812, where Jeffersonian Madison was running against the Federalist, Federalist DeWitt Clinton. Madison was burdened by the wars with uh, Britain around the globe. He was uh, a liberal, and he was running against this Federalist businessman. Well, 200 years ago, how did they respond to it? The candidates responded pretty well, but the, the pro-Clinton Connecticut Current, a newspaper, described Mads Madisonians after the election as demagogues and bandits. That's pretty strong. I wonder whether after this election, the Republicans and the Democrats will call each other Democrat, uh, bandits and demagogues. Uh, how will we behave? How will you behave after the election? What is sportsmanship? Does it have any role in that? Now, maybe in a post-Title IX world, we should call it sports sportspersonship, because after all, men and women, I think, should be following the rules the same way as uh, the other gender. But I'm going to go out on a limb here, and I'm going to say that when it comes to bad sportsmanship, men are worse. I think men more often cheat, mope about losing, gloat about winning, or generally forget that winning and losing is less important than other things in life. You may disagree with me, but from what I've seen it, I think women have a better perspective on these sorts of things. So perhaps we do need more sports manship, but whatever you call it, what do we mean by it? I mean, is it like pornography that you know it when you see it? I think sometimes that's the case. For example, Let's say you're a manager of a baseball team, you just lost a game, and at the media conference afterwards you're asked, why did you lose? Which of these four is the most exemplifying uh, good sportsmanship? It's the ump's fault. The other team was better than us. We stunk. It was just bad luck. Which is the best? The ump's fault? No, really? That's not good sportsmanship? The other team was better than us? Yeah, we stunk? I don't think so necessarily. Maybe, maybe. And I don't think bad luck. Ah, that's okay. Some, sometimes it is. Well, after the Orioles down in Baltimore lost to the Yankees this year, Bucky Showalter said it was because their pitcher, CeCe Sabathia, was better than us today. And I think that's an example of good sportsmanship. 
if it was true. I do think it has to be connected to the reality. Wikipedia defines sportsmanship as an aspiration or ethos that a sport or activity will be enjoyed for its proper consideration of fairness, ethics, respect, and fellowship with one's competitors. I think that's pretty good. But I'm going to suggest the following four. I'm going to examine each of these. I think sportsmanship includes following the rules, not cheating. I think it includes competing hard. I think it includes respecting your opponent. And I think it includes respecting the game, win or lose. Respect, I think, includes a graciousness in defeat or victory. So let me begin to look a little bit more into sports, and then we'll see how it can play into helping us understand politics. Regarding the rules, I think that's got to be the most uncontroversial aspect of sportsmanship. I mean, if there weren't word rules, we'd have chaos. Playing by the rules is playing fair. Any six-year-old knows that. But adults cheat all of the time. I mean, there's spitballs and baseballs. There's the rigging of the scales and horse racing, doping scandals. I mean, performance-enhancing drugs are everywhere. And now the sports hero comeback of all times, Lance Armstrong, has been found guilty as charged. <laughs> We focus on the celebrities like Roger Clemens or Barry Bonds, but how many other people have been taking drugs for doping? Uh, I've even heard that the Viking Association is not going to award a second place because they're pretty sure that anybody who been first and 40th place was involved in doping in, in Viking. So it's, it's widespread. So is it money that turns adults into cheaters? Is it fame? Is it a system that turns them into cheaters? Michael Clark, who works with the Institute for the Study of Youth Sports out of Michigan State, thinks it is the adults that are to blame. He says an interesting thing. He's, in a study, he said younger athletes are more interested in fairness about their games, while older athletes before become more concerned with winning. He adds that even when fairness is set aside, young kids prefer to play than win or lose. The winning or losing is not important. In other words, they'd rather play on a losing team than sit on the bench of a winning team. So play is most important. But if kids actually care less about fairness as they grow older, I wonder whether it's the Uber coaches and the fanatic parents that are creating this change in them. Do they teach kids to win, win, win at all costs? I mean, look at the TV coverage from the Olympic Games. It almost myopically focused on American winners, didn't it? Occasionally the crushing, tragic, defeated persons there, but it's almost always about the winner. That's all that matters. Well, some try to counter this overemphasis. I have a good friend who works for an institution called the Positive Coaching Alliance, and they offer workshops and seminars to help train bad-behaving parents and coaches and players how to actually practice sportsmanship. Uh, playing by the rules, they do emphasize, but mainly they focus on building character and creating good citizenship out of sportsmanship. There was a time when I almost could equate sportsmanship with good citizenship. If you remember the uh, 1924 Olympic Games, there was a film, Chariots of Fire, remember that? A marvelous film. What struck me about that film comparing it to today is that almost all of the athletes were heroic, ethical, amateur athletes. It was about honor, those games. Playing by the rules, certainly, but this is kind of sportsmanship you don't see as much anyway. And it's talked about in a book that I've read a little bit of called The Ethics of Challenge, Strengthening Your Integrity in a Greedy World. It shares a story of a, a Cornell football team in 1940 that was undefeated, and they were losing to Dartmouth 3 to nothing. They were on the Dartmouth six-yard line with four downs to score. And because of a mix-up over a penalty, the referees gave them an extra down when they scored on that final down. After the game, the referees reviewed the films and informed Cornell. The Cornell president, athletic director, coaches, and teams decided to write to Dartmouth and offer to forfeit the game, which they did. Would that happen today? No way. No way that would happen today. The drive for victories is way too strong in the big business of college sports. Which brings me to this other part of sportsmanship, competing hard, competing hard for it. Now, given so easily uh, competition gets out of hand, uh, 
you might wonder, well, why do you have to even encourage that? <clears throat> but yeah, and that, that's true to a degree. Uh, our founder, Felix Adler, had an issue with competition, especially in the business world. He writes about how everyone's caught up in the, quote, giddy race of competition, seldom disturbed by thoughts of larger concerns. So is it this giddy race of competition that blinds parents and coaches to teaching proper sportsmanship to adolescents? Arthur Dobrin, who was the leader of the Long Island Ethical Society for years, wrote a book called Teaching Right from Wrong, 40 Things You Can Do to Raise a Moral Child. And he said, cited a number of studies that actually showed that when children are encouraged to compete, bias and bigotry in their attitudes grows. Now, I don't think competition alone is responsible for that. In my experience, a drive to win doesn't necessarily lead to unethical behavior. In fact, in my life, I think that my experience in sports, which was pretty much through, throughout my, my educational career, uh, gave me some good discipline, some resilience, and respect for my opponents, a sense of humility, which losing can create, but as well as winning. Now, Competition can do weird things. For example, at the, the Summer Games in London, it led to a scandal in the women's badminton competition. Anybody remember this? Yeah. Uh, a number of teams, Indonesia, Korea, uh, China, were all disqualified because the women's badminton team lost on purpose. Because for some reason, in the first round, if they were to lose, they'd get into an easier second bracket in the second round. So they were disqualified, they were booed by the fans, but this is weird that your drive to win would lead you to lose. And I think it disrespects the game, and I think it disrespects your opponent. I mean, I do think it's a sign of respect to try hard to beat your opponent. I hated it when I was a kid when other people would, quote, let me win. I didn't think it was an honest portrayal of the game. So I think there are times, however, certainly the competition should be put aside. But when does that happen? That takes discernment. I think, for example, this was a great example of this discernment. There was a five foot two outfielder for Western Oregon University who hit her first home run of her career, and she was rounding the base pads, and she collapsed at first base, and the umpire said that nobody on her team could help her. Well, the opponent's first baseman said, can I help her? And because she was on the field, she could. So she limped around the bases with her opponent, and as they were crossing home plate, they were laughing, but everybody in the fans, in this, the, all the fans and the coaches were crying over this. We don't hear enough about those sorts of things. Uh, sometimes you have awards that are awarded for sportsmanship. Uh, one that I looked up, I find often international soccer to be some of the greatest examples of bad sportsmanship, but FIFA has an award called the Fair Play Award. I want to share a couple of the winners. 19, in 2010, an Iranian player was given the award because they kicked the ball out of bounds rather than scoring an empty net goal when the opposition goalie collapsed. In 2000, in, um, oh, Gary Lineker, who's an English player, played international soccer for 15 years without ever receiving a red or yellow card. Not a single foul in 15 years. He was given the award. And sometimes the award says to everybody, you know what, this is just a game and there are more important things. And so FIFA gave the award, for example, to the entire Barcelona soccer organization because back in 2007, they were involved in humanitarian children's organizations all over the world, so they got the award. Both the United States and Iran got the award for the men's soccer tournament in the World Cup because of their good sportsmanship, even though the countries had been hostile with each other for years. So these sorts of awards, I think, can nurture this. But the fourth part of sportsmanship, which I think is the most difficult, is respecting the game, win or lose. And what does that mean? For me, I think it includes everything I've discussed so far. Obeying the rules, competing hard, respecting your opponent. But I also think it contains an element of keeping the game in perspective. Realizing the game is a part of life and not life itself. That doesn't mean dismissing it as just a game, as my wife often does. Because I think when you pour in your effort and your passion, it can be more than just a game. It can really be an expression of who you are and a way to develop values. But still, I think we need to learn to win and lose more gracefully. What does that mean? 
A couple of seasons ago, I heard a commentator discuss the World Series celebration, and they said an interesting thing. They said, after the game, the winning team always looks like little boys. They're jumping up and down and laughing and grinning, but the losing team looks much older, like the burden of this lost opportunity begins to get etched into their faces. And I think that's interesting. They have to learn to carry on, to learn from their mistakes, they have to learn to grow. Whereas I think it's a little less ethically challenging to, to win. Just a couple of weeks ago, this was impressed upon me when my Cinderella Washington Nationals team went down to crushing defeat. I couldn't sleep, so I, I wrote the following little reflection that I'll share. The game's over, the room's empty and silent. My buddies have left, shaking their heads. We were up two runs with one strike to go. One strike. Then the impossible happened, as it often does in baseball. <coughs> it hurts to lose. My new favorite team, the Washington Nationals, just lost. And they didn't just lose, they lost in excruciating fashion. It was a cruel loss. Final game of a playoff series, they were leading six to nothing after three innings, entering the ninth up seven to five. Tense middle innings, and then, if I were a superstitious, superstitious person, I might say, Fate began to turn. A leadoff double, no problem. One out, good. Two outs, better. Two strikes, tantalizingly close to defeating the St. Louis Cardinals for the first postseason victory in Washington history since 1933. But then, if I were a suspicious person, I'd say our destiny unfolded. Defeat was snatched from the jaws of victory. Post-adrenaline crash and a heavy heart sent me to bed. It's a cruel game, it's a great game, it's just a game. So why does it hurt so bad? <laughs> now this passage exaggerates a little bit because it didn't hurt that bad. It didn't hurt as bad as when I was a kid because I was a Red Sox fan. I suffered deeply for what I admit is a relatively objectively trivial thing. Somebody's got to win or lose. And who can I blame for this? Well, I blame my mother. Because <laughs> she bought me this. <laughs> Not only did she buy me this, you know what she bought for my older brother who was two and a half years older than me, who I fought with and always lost? A Yankees uniform. <laughs> you know, I think we lived in New Haven, Connecticut, and she didn't know any better, and I was burdened for life. From then on, I was doomed to despair with those other Red Sox fanatics, cursed by the 1920 trade of Babe Ruth to the Yankees. So I remember being on the sixth grade bus, listening to the St. Louis Cardinal fans up ahead of me back in 1968 or whatever, cheering their World Series victory that afternoon. And I was in the back of the bus, peeling the Boston Red Sox bumper sticker off my briefcase with tears in my eyes. That was 1967. Then there was freshman year in college at a dorm halfway between New York and Boston, and I reveled in Carlton Fisk's great sixth game heroics where the ball went for the home run at the end, only to be mocked by Yankee fans, gleefully seeing us lose to the Reds in the seventh. That was 1975. The worst, of course, was 1986. One strike away from the World Series championship, the first one in Boston since 1980. The champagne was already uncorked in the Boston locker room. Then, if I were a suspicious person, I'd say the ghost of Babe Ruth walked onto the field. I couldn't watch the last few, few of the plays. I was in my friend Charlie's bathroom, hiding from the horror. And so after Bob Stanley's wild pitch and Bill Buckner's error, it was over. Inconceivable. We gotta go, I told my wife, and I grabbed my coat. She said, really? Because she thought it was rude to leave so abruptly. We gotta go, I said, more softly. Because I was in shock, and I was sinking slowly into anguish. I kept replaying all the bad plays over and over again in my head, and I grieved through the seventh game that I knew we were gonna lose anyway, that was clear. I was a zombie for days, a broken man. I did not lose gracefully. Since then, I've never rooted so blindly or so fully for any sports team. And that's probably a good thing, 
I enjoy sports, I root for my team, but I won't ever give all of myself like I did then, not in a sporting event. I always hold something back. That's how it was in 2004 when the Red Sox finally did win it all. Down three games to none to the Yankees, the dreaded Yankees, they finally did the impossible. And they just didn't win, they won in a miraculous fashion. Down in the last game, all of a sudden these heroics, Johnny Damon, Big Poppy, Kurt Schilling with a bloody ankle, and they won. And victory was sweet, a little muted, but still sweet. So who do I have to thank for that moment? My mother. <laughs> because as the Yankees were beating the Red Sox in the fourth game, my son, Justin, ran upstairs, put that on, came downstairs, and from that moment on, the Red Sox went on to win eight consecutive games to win the World Series. We're not superstitious and ethical humans, by the way. But it is easier to win than it is to lose. Losing gracefully is really hard. Because when you care so much about something, pain gets in the way of grace. And that much sports has taught me. So I wonder how everybody will do, win or lose, after this election. What can sports teach us about how we can lose after this election or win after this election? Well, certainly US history, I go back to it all the time. And I ask myself, how did people suffer through these things in the past? Do people practice good sports? How much cheating is there? Well, there's a certain amount of certain wriggle room in politics. Uh, the biggest quote unquote bad sportsmanship in presidential elections, historically at least, was 1824, when Andrew Jackson got the most electoral votes and the most popular vote, but because he didn't get the majority of electoral votes, it went to the House. Well, second place was John Quincy Adams. Third place was Henry Clay. Henry Clay, it was said, convinced Congress to throw their votes to Adams, even though Jackson was clearly a winner of the plurality of the votes. And all of a sudden, Clay becomes Secretary of State for John Quincy Adams. So this was denounced as a corrupt bargain, and for the next four years, Adams was criticized for this, and it really launched Jackson into the White House and 1828. But this kind of political horse trading is going to occur all the time. And it's not really cheating, but it's still considered bad sportsmanship in some way. But what's really scary is the blatant manipulation of our system at this point. I mean, people talk about ballot box stuffing, voter fraud, uh, electronic mischief now. Uh, certainly the accusations surrounding the election of 2000 and 2004 are deeply troubling, much more damning than the horse trading of Clay and Adams. And there's something wrong with a system that puts electoral decisions into the hands of electoral, of, of, of people from a party. Secretaries of states are in charge of the electoral system in each state, and they are political representatives of, of a certain party. So there are certain very fundamental problems, hanging chats, voter ID, changes in voting, early voting hours. It all seems to be manipulated for political purposes. It's haphazard and it's open for cheating. Now, even scarier than that was this whole business is about computerized voting. How hard it is to be certain that there's no cheating going on when you don't have a paper ballot to double check it. Uh, I read all these liberal bloggers bemoaning the fact that there are connections between uh, Romney, Bain Capital, the Republican Party, and a certain company like Hart InterCivic, which is an Austin based computer voting firm, which is actually having the machines in the Hamilton County, Ohio area around Cincinnati. And I don't know enough about it. Uh, these may be conspiracy theorists run amok. I don't know. But remember four years ago, there were similar stories about Dime, Diebold, which was an Ohio-based voting company, whose chief executive wrote to George Bush saying he would help, quote, deliver the state to the incumbent. Now, both sides are accused of cheating in every election, but we have to demand as voters transparency and investigations of potential voter manipulation or our democracy is in serious trouble. Plenty of people say it's already too late. I hope not. Regarding the part of sportsmanship of uh, competing hard, it seems hard to imagine we complain that our candidates aren't competing hard enough. It's like they live in our houses now through our television sets. 
Back in 1920, Warren Harding ran a political campaign for the presidency, which was called the Front Porch Campaign, because he never left his house. Literally. Well, maybe not literally, but he virtually did it. Nowadays, candidates don't even see their houses anymore. The first couple, the first five or six political presidential campaigns, the candidates themselves thought it was unseemly to campaign for the presidency. So maybe nowadays we should dial that back a little, because it's this hyper-electioneering. Maybe the idea of a limited campaign period, like in Europe, makes more sense. And our first president was gravely concerned with what he called the spirit of party that would turn politics shallow and nasty. Most people don't realize political parties weren't planned. They just occurred. George Washington argued against entrenched political parties. And in fact, in his farewell address, he argued against it. But one Federalist commentator said that that farewell address, when he said he wasn't going to run for a third term, was like a starting gun in a race or a dropping of a hat. And he said, quote, the party racers were off. And they never looked back. We've had party politics and competition forever since then. One historian, Paul Bowler, has compared, he said, when George Washington, he said, as competition to succeed, to succeed Washington increased on both sides, there were handbills, pamphlets, and articles in party newspapers and posted everywhere that, quote, denounced, disparaged, damned, decried, declaimed, and denigrated. All of these things were a big part of American politics by the turn of the eight, by 1800. And while candidates, as I said, didn't dirty their hands early on, both just the, the, their, their representatives did, like Jefferson and Adams. So they could be better sports with each other. They knew each other very well. When Jefferson lost in, 18, in 1796 to Adams, it was said that he was actually relieved. And he always said that he, quote, deferred to Adams. And so there was this general camaraderie because they knew each other as human beings before they knew each other as opponents. But by the next election, Jefferson was a little bit more competitive. One 19th century congressman said he moaned, he said, quote, it was a pleasure to live in the good old days in 1800 when a Federalist could knock down a Republican in the street and not be questioned about it. Well, we learn today, we hear about Romney and Obama not really liking each other. People have commented on their testiness. I don't know how much of that is real. But certainly Ann Romney, really called, uh, called out Obama and said he was guilty of bad sportsmanship because he called her husband a liar. She said, quote, Obama, he said, Obama acted like somebody, quote, in the sandbox that lost the game and they're just going to kick sand in somebody's face and say, you liar. So candidates today are always accused of this and I don't know how they walk this line between seeming polite to each other but also competing hard. It's a fine line between the two. I think the results are mixed. But finally, what about respecting the game? What about respecting politics? Can politicians compete very hard and yet serve the institutions and the public trust? During their campaign, afterwards, winning or losing? Pat actually, McGeever spoke to me about this title because he worried that in some ways, should we mix sports and politics? It's true, it's difficult. He wondered whether or not back in 2008 when the Republicans lost, they basically said, we're not going to cooperate with the president at all. And they just walked away from any potential uh, cooperation. And he wonders, is that bad sportsmanship? You could argue that, in fact, that's an example of sticking to your principles, of being true to your beliefs. And what I said to, to Pat was, I don't ever need to equate sportsmanship with not standing up for your principles. Because as I said, I think competing hard is important. Caring deeply about this country and about politics is, to my sense, respecting my political opponents, taking them seriously, taking politics seriously. So I think that sportsmanship should go hand in hand with competing hard in politics. But, and when somebody wins or loses, that's really where it's tested, because it's over at that point. What's going to happen after November 6th? Winning sports is not the same as winning politics. I mean, you win the Super Bowl, that's it, it's over. You can relax, drink your champagne, and say, I'm going to Disney World. But after you win in a presidential election, that's when the hard work really starts. If you are a political activist, Wednesday morning is where your work really starts, win or lose. Well, 
I know that when a candidate loses, the concession speech is difficult. When somebody wins, you have to act magnanimous and with equanimity and maturity because you need the cooperation of the other person. We haven't had it over the last four years. I hope whoever wins on Tuesday is going to have the strength of character to turn back to a more cooperative form of government that we did have and do, does exist this potential. I think there's a shallow, negative, political, political ethos right now that without a real injection of integrity, we're going to lose. Now, the losing candidate, it's not always like all things are lost for the losing candidate. Sometimes after the campaign, they are able to take their notoriety and turn it into something positive. I mean, look at the losers of the Republican nomination. Herman Cain and Newt Gingrich, they sort of revive their careers. They're invited onto TV programs and high speaking fees are paid to them. Mike Huckabee converted his brief 2008 leadership position with a program on Fox. And after Bob Dole lost the election in 96, he became the, uh, the salesman for Pepsi and Viagra. <laughs> Go Bob. <laughs> Many, many other people do recover and actually serve the public trust very well. Taft became Chief Justice. Wendell Wilkie, after he lost to Franklin Roosevelt in 1940, wrote a book called One World that some people said really paved the way the United Nations. Dewey, who lost tragically to, Dumin, to Truman, uh, managed to grow his New York law firm and was really a major player in the Republican Party for years after that. But for most who lose, Dewey included, the pain was very deep. There was a story that Dewey went to an office party after he lost at his law firm and the band played Hail to the Chief. They thought it would cheer him up. He left the party, he never returned. He was still wounded. Herbert Humphrey, when he lost to Nixon, he said that was the worst moment of his life. He said he could almost cry. George McGovern in 1972 said, Quote, there are some things that are worse than losing an election. It's hard to think what they are on election day. <laughs> Walter Mondale in 1980 asked McGovern when the pain would subside. And McGovern supposedly said, I'll let you know when I get there. <laughs> so to bear that level of disappointment and be a good sport is a challenge, especially in a concession speech. Now, a few concession speech must have been, could have been more difficult than Al Gore's in 2000. I mean, there's an election where many people felt it was stolen from him. And some people blame him for not fighting on, but I did admire his grace. He balanced concession of the election with sticking to his beliefs. This is what he said. Just moments ago, I spoke with George W. Bush and congratulated him on becoming the 43rd President of the United States. I offered to meet with him as soon as possible so that we can start heal the divisions of the campaign. Almost a century and a half ago, Senator Stephen Douglas called Abraham Lincoln, who had just defeated him for the presidency. Partisan feelings must yield to patriotism. I am with you, Mr. President, and God bless you. Well, in that same spirit, I say to President-elect Bush that what remains of partisan rancor, partisan rancor must be now set aside. And while there will be time enough to debate our continuing differences, now is the time to recognize that that which unites us is greater than that which divides us. While we yet hold and do not yield our opposing beliefs, there is a higher duty than one that we owe to our own political party. This is America where we put, par where we put country before party. That would be nice, wouldn't it? We will stand together behind our new president. As for the battle that ends tonight, or continues, I do believe that my father, as my father once said, that no matter how hard the loss, defeat might serve as well as victory to shape the soul and let the glory out. Well, whatever you think of Gore, I think he did try to bring out his best. I think he tried to follow rules. I think he played by them. I think he tried to make the best of a horrible situation. And he didn't stop defending his principles. He went on to become a tireless crusader for uh, working against climate change. He also spent many, 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 many long hours of working on critiquing the lack of honesty that pulled us into the war against Iraq. So I think he followed the rules. I think he was a good sport. I think he practiced good sportsmanship. And I don't know whether he learned that 
being a high school football captain, which he was. But I think it probably played a role in that. The most recent election, general election loser, John McCain, he didn't take his ball and go home either. I mean, he didn't abandon his principles after the election. In fact, I think maybe he returned to them after a brief Tea Party Madness episode during the campaign. In his concession speech, he said, Senator Obama and I have argued over our differences and he has prevailed. No doubt many of those differences remain. These are difficult times for our country. And I pledge to him tonight to do all in my power to help him lead us through the many challenges we face. I urge all Americans who supported me to join me in not just congratulating him, but offering our next president our goodwill and earnest effort to find ways to come together, to find necessary compromises, to bridge our differences, to help restore pr prosperity, defend our security in a dangerous world, and leave our children and grandchildren to a stronger, better country than we inherited. So how long did that last? <laughs> It didn't make it through the speech. McCain multiple times had to quiet the crowd to not boo when he mentioned Obama's name. So I think that was like the tip of the iceberg that told me that what we experienced in this campaign really started then, and maybe has been going on for years. Whatever side we're on, winning or losing, will we soldier on defending our principles without demeaning our opponents? Will we demonstrate good sportsmanship in something that's much more important than a game? It is tricky to use sports analogies to explain politics, but I think our national pastime could use a dose of sportsmanship. We must insist that our candidates play by the rules, compete hard, and respect each other and the system. And whether drunk with victory or in the agony of defeat, we all have to continue to remain true to our beliefs while avoiding bitter, destructive partisanship. Standing by our principles while standing with our opponents is not easy. It takes openness, communication, patience, willingness to listen. Are we going to do that after this election, win or lose, after a brief celebratory moment or grieving, whichever it is, are we going to get back on our feet and work with each other? That's the question. I think for the sake of our nation, for the sake of our children, we all have to learn more and more how to be good sports. Thank you.